Hi, good morning, uh, Dr. Lok. Can you hear me? Hi, morning. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Loud and okay. clear. Okay, uh, I think now it's 11 already, so maybe we can start on the session. All right, uh, good morning, uh, all the ladies and gentlemen for the Red Crescent uh, member and officer. And also we are welcome Dr. Lo, all right. So basically today our very special day for Red Crescent because in the worldwide, we are celebrating the World Red Cross and Red Crescent Day. So today, uh, in significant to uh, in conjunction to celebrate this uh, special day, World Red Cross and Red Crescent Day. So uh, in the MRCS Malaysia Red Crescent Finance State Training Division, we organize this webinar to all our uh, Red Crescent member, especially for the youth, not which is in the secondary school member. All right. So uh, as we understand that now during the pandemic COVID, you no, know, uh, maybe a lot of people they may be facing some of the problem and so on. So I think that uh, today is the right topic that we do discuss, which is the mental health. So. Uh, before I start with this session, let me uh, just introduce our speaker of the day. He is the Dr. Lu Wunshen. Lu Wunshen, sorry. He is the Dr. Lu Wunshen. He is the uh, psychiatric and also lecturer from the Department of Psychiatric Hospital University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Right, he is a very experienced doctor and lecturer, and he has been publicized a number of the paper on psychiatric and mental health. So, uh, without further ado, let me welcome Dr. It's your floor. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ng, for your kind introduction, and I thank um, the PPSM of uh, Penang for uh, inviting me for this talk. So, yeah, at the beginning, I just want to um, have some um, technical issue here. Can I know how do I share my slide? Because I don't see the option for me to share slides with you. Uh, okay, can you see the dot there? More action? Maybe while we are waiting for doctor can introduce more about yourself or your uh, experience and so on, so that just to share with all the participants. Okay, sure. Uh, so my name is Luke. So I'm a psychiatrist uh, in hospital, uh, uh, hospital Chancellor Tonko Morris, uh, Hospital UKM, which is the teaching hospital of UKM. And uh, I have um, joined it as a faculty member uh, since uh, two years ago. Before this, I was uh, a specialist, a doctor in uh, KKM in government hospital in MOH hospital. So of course, uh, as my um, part of my duties as a uh, uh, specialist and lecturer in UKM, so I'm involved in both uh, clinical uh, care of patients with mental health issues as well as uh, the academic duties such as uh, teaching of both undergraduate and postgraduate students and also uh, research activities. So um, well, so it's a combination of both. Uh, theoretical knowledge and also clinical practice and yes uh, relevant to today's topic we see a lot of people with stress with mental health issues especially you know, during as what I mentioned earlier at the introduction during this pandemic uh, mco period so both existing patients who already have uh, pre-existing mental health issues they may come back to us with more severe issues and also we are seeing new patients coming to us because of these um, issues that they face during this pandemic, like financial issues and so on. So yeah, so I would say that uh, we do see um, increasing trend of uh, issues with mental health, as I will share with you in my slides later. And part of it, I think very important, our role here is in our hospital, of course, we are more of treating patients, but if we can do more of mental health promotion, to prevent mental health issues from happening and getting worse, I think that would be the best. And this is also why I'm happy to be here to share with you uh, about this topic uh, as an effort for uh, mental health promotion. So yeah, so this is the um, topic given to me, uh, controlling emotions when stressed. So as I already told you about the outline, we will move forward to the next slide. So this is as defined by WHO, what is health? It's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So you can see that mental health is an important component of health. Next. So what about mental health itself? So WHO again design, defined it as such a uh, state of well-being and so on. But the important point I want to tell you here is someone who is mentally healthy 
as you can see in the third line, it is highlighted there that it's someone who can cope with stresses of life. So you can see here uh, whether we can cope with our stress in an effective manner is closely related to the uh, state of our mental health. Next slide. So this slide is to show you the concept of uh, mental health. You can see here that yes, a lot of time we define someone as mentally healthy or not healthy based on whether the person is diagnosed with a mental disorder, a psychiatric disorder or not. But you can see actually not just those who are ill have to be concerned with their mental health. In a lot of time, more of us, more of us I believe we are in the healthy state. We do not have uh, any major mental health issues. But uh, because of the issues, the problems we are facing in our daily life, so we may have some um, changes, some responses uh, with, with regards to our mental health, which, which ultimately if is not well managed, can lead to um, mental ill health or mental disorder or mental illness. So this is why we have to act early uh, to prevent some uh, responses or reactions to mental health issues to become a uh, real uh, mental illness. Next slide. So in general, how is the state of mental health in Malaysia? According to the National Health and Morbidity Survey done in 2015, uh, roughly about one in three uh, adults in Malaysia is found to have some level of mental health issues. So, of course, it doesn't mean that one in three persons have mental disorder, but it is telling us that there are some level of mental disturbances, uh, and it is quite common in our population. And next slide, if you look at the trend of it, compared to the earlier surveys, national surveys in the previous decades, you can see that actually the trend is upgoing. So this is uh, something of concern to us. Next slide. So of course, just somewhere we talk about this mental health issue in general, but how about stress? If you look at this slide, you can see that there are multiple definitions of stress. These are some of the examples I've taken from the internet. So you see stress, the first one is defined as some uh, factors causing tension. And the second one mentioned that stress is how our body responds to some demands. And the last one mentioned it is kind of feeling or tension that we experience. So what it is actually, how come they are so different other and all the few different uh, definitions about stress? So what I want to clarify to you that actually there are different components to it and I'm going to explain it to you. We look at the next slide. So actually there are a few concepts we have to understand here. Stressors, our stress response and also the outcomes of stress. Next slide. So this, the, this is the relationship between these few terms that I mentioned just now. So when we talk about stress, sometimes we refer to different things. First, we might be referring to stressors, which are the factors that may cause um, some unpleasant response to us. So we are talking about the factors when we say stressors. And when we talk about stress response, it means that our body, our mind uh, responses to these external factors. And ultimately, it's the outcome. What are the changes that happen to us? due to our response to these stresses. So you can see that actually uh, that's why not, uh, there are different um, definitions of stress because we are talking about different components of it. Either it's the, the, the factors or, or the response that we have or the outcomes of these stresses. Okay, next slide. So this is what I mean. So why there are different, um, different definitions because we are referring to different components of it. Okay, next. So why do we have to have this stress response? So first of all, we must understand stress is not something that is uh, negative entirely. In fact, it is part of our surviving mechanism to have this stress response. Uh, as you know, when we face with some danger or some threat, we need to find a way to deal with it. So this is what we call as the fight or flight um, mechanism. So our brain, our body have to be prepared to overcome the difficulty either by confronting it head on or we have to uh, get away from it, escape from it. So what really happened during this stress response are uh, actually preparing us to deal with the challenge. So we can see what are really happening in the following slide. So can you move on? Okay, so in stress response, uh, our body uh, make adjustment in such a way that our circulation is 
uh, redirected. Uh, blood is directed to the brain, to the large muscles, to allow ourselves to mentally and also physically prepare for emergency. Next. And at the same time, our brain is also become more alert. So this um, system in our brain is to make ourselves more alert so that we are able to uh, be more vigilant and sense any uh, dangers that is happening in our surrounding. Next. And at the same time, our body release more glucose, more fatty acids. These are the fuel. These are the these are the energy source that uh, is made available to our body to uh, to respond uh, effectively with the energy that is provided from these um, substances in our body. Next one. And because of this, all this redirection of blood circulation of energy source to those uh, functions like muscular functions, brain function to respond to stress. So other systems like our digestive systems, our immune system become uh, like partially shut down because these resources are already redirected to the functions to deal with the emergency. And that's how later you will see certain bodily functions become impaired when we are exposed to stress for a prolonged period. Okay, let's move on. So again, go back to the slide of, that I showed you earlier about stressors, stress response and outcome. Now we want to um, understand it a bit more detail. So in fact, the stress response that we give to some stressors can be divided to what we call as good stress response and bad stress response. So you stress are the good ones, meaning uh, with this kind of stress responses, we are able to deal with the challenge or the emergency effectively. But sometimes our body is not able to do that. Uh, but the response that we give to this situation actually lead to more issues, more problems. And this is what we call as distress. Okay, next. So as I mentioned, you stress is positive. It's a healthy response that lead to uh, motivation, drive to actually go and face and solve the problem. But distress will actually lead to uh, some problems, some impairments in our psychological and also behavioral function. Okay, next one. So another, another way of looking at stress is that we need certain level of stress uh, to function well. So sometimes too little stress is also not good because we will lack the motivation to perform what we are supposed to do. But if the level of stress is too high and too sustained too long, it can actually lead to burnout. So the, the take home message here is an adequate, uh, a, a suitable level of stress is actually good. It's actually helpful for us to function well, to perform well. But too little stress and too much stress are not good. And of course, we know in our usual situation nowadays, it's too much stress that's causing problem to us. So negative response to stress, too much of tension, too much, too high level of stress are not good for us. Okay, next one. So as I said, stress is necessary. We need stress to, to function. We need stress to do well, to, to solve our problem. Stress, stress is not always bad. But, okay, next one. When stress uh, response is negative, is distress, it can lead to a bad outcome. So this is what we mean by uh, stress usually when we um, survey the population, when we do interview and we will ask people about their, the stress that they suffer from. We are referring to this kind of negative stress response and the negative outcomes that is um, caused by this kind of negative stress response. So this is what we mean by stress uh, generally. And this is what we are going to discuss further after this. Okay, next slide. So based on this understanding of stress, how common it is in our population? So another National Health and Morbidity Survey that was conducted in 2017 among adolescents, those among, uh, between 13 to 17 years old, it showed that it was quite common in this age group, uh, about one in 10, about 10% of them actually suffer from stress, stress symptoms, okay? Next one. So as mentioned, uh, 
stress is uh, very high eh, nowadays because of the pandemic. And of course, for the frontliners, it's especially, especially so. So a uh, survey conducted recently uh, by our team uh, for among uh, healthcare workers in USM and UKM, uh, we noticed that, yes, the stress levels it was high. It was as high as about 30%, as you can see. Okay, next one. Yeah, about 29.1%, 30% of them suffer from stress. And among other high-risk groups also, you will see that uh, stress level is very high. So you can see the next slide. For example, among teachers, secondary school teachers, the figure is also similar. Okay, next, can you just press again? Yeah, it's about 30 something, 30% 30 of them screen positive for stress. And it is also true for those who are in the uh, underprivileged group, like those with low socioeconomic uh, status. Okay, next one. Yeah, like this study among those uh, from low income families in Kuala Lumpur, again, the stress level is uh, high, about one third of them also suffer from stress. Okay, next. Okay, next. So now we want to look at the factors that can lead to stress. So generally speaking, it can be divided into internal factors that are present in ourselves, in our own, and also factors in uh, our environment, external factors. So among the internal factors are like biological factors. If you are physically unwell, if you are sick, so this can lead to stress. Personality, someone with um, more um, uh, worrisome kind of uh, outlook of life, uh, pessimistic of, uh, outlook of life, uh, tend to be, um, how to say, less sociable, not much of social support from others because the person is uh, introvert and uh, quiet. So this is some of the personality traits that can lead to more stress when faced with difficulties. Negative emotions, you know, um, uh, emo um, tend to have low mood and also negative thinking about oneself. This can all uh, potentially lead to um, um, stress. And external factors, including physical environment, uh, social interaction with other people, social relationships, some uh, major events that happen in life, and also the, the organization, the institution where you are. These are some of the things that can also lead to stress. Okay, next one. So sometimes the external stressor that happen to us, it can be in the form of major life events. Some important uh, big things happen in life can be stressful. But a lot of other times, it's more of minor daily hassles, small, small inconveniences, uh, difficulties, uh, unpleasant events that we face day to day. This can also build up our stress level. Okay, next one. So uh, a bit more explanation about some of the external stressors that we may face. So one is uh, role factors. For example, a lot of us, those who have family, you may face this difficulty of um, work family conflict uh, because of the demands of your workplace and demands of your role as a parent, as a, as a child and so on, um, can have conflicts here and lead to distress. And another one is about the job itself, of course, high workload can lead to a higher level of stress. Next one. And physical factors, as I mentioned, our environment, you not know, when it is too cramped, when it's too uh, hot, too uncomfortable, especially during the previous street lockdown, a lot of people are uh, isolated uh, in a small place. This kind of physical factor can also add on to stress. And inter interpersonal factors, when we have um, conflicts with people around us due to the difference in uh, opinions, difference in personality, this can also add on to stress. Next one. Okay, how about uh, symptoms of stress? So we are going to look at these different domains about our thinking, cognitive symptoms, emotional symptoms, physical symptoms, and also behavioral symptoms. Okay, next. So physical symptoms of stress include body aches, um, poor immune system, as I mentioned, your immune system will shut down you know, when you're under uh, AD stress, and this can lead to infections. Uh, uh, body defense, defense system become weak, and stomach ailments, a lot of digestive problems, for example, and also cardiovascular stress, which can lead to conditions like hypertension and so on. Next. 
emotional stress symptoms, moody, irritable, unable to relax, uh, feeling overwhelmed and lonely. And next one, cognitive symptoms. So sometimes you can be, have difficulty to remember things well, cannot concentrate well, uh, tend to make poor judgment and a lot of negative thinkings and worries. Next one. Uh, next, behavioral symptoms. Okay. Um, sometimes person may tend to uh, view up, uh, cope with this kind of uh, stress with some behaviors which are not so healthy, like uh, overeating or undereating, uh, excessive sleep or insomnia, no difficulty to sleep, uh, social isolation from others, and uh, inability, lack of motivation to complete tasks or fulfill responsibilities. So these are some of the symptoms of stress. Next. Okay, so what are the consequences of stress on us? So it can be on the individuals who suffer from stress and also on the organization where you are. So the individual symptoms are basically like what we have covered earlier. So move on to the next slide. So we can have behavioral problem, you not know, eating problem. Sometimes the aggression you know, can lead to bullying and violence. And a lot of times, unfortunately, when we try to self-medicate to reduce the symptoms of stress, uh, uh, it can lead to misuse of certain substances like uh, smoking, alcohol use, and also substance use. Next. And psychological uh, sequences, as I mentioned, insomnia, no, burnout, it can lead to anxiety disorders and also depression. Okay, next. As you can see here, uh, a lot of time, uh, depression happened after uh, some major stress uh, stressful events. So one study estimated that there's a six-fold increase of stressful life events before the onset of stress. And this diagram actually show you, this figure show you about some of the major life events that can be stressful for people like um, um, divorce, um, separation from your partners, um, bereavement, passing away of some of the relatives, financial difficulties, or employment, uh, in unemployment and so on. Okay, next one. And when particular life event is very, very stressful, very severe, like a major trauma, it can actually lead to specific um, uh, specific disorders like acute stress disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. Of course, due to time constraint, we cannot talk about this more, uh, but just want to let you know about this. Next one. So medical consequences, as I said, uh, Stress can actually alter our bodily functions, leading to uh, cardiovascular changes like hypertension, uh, like some of our behavioral changes, poor eating, and a lack of physical activities, and can also contribute to these medical problems like heart disease, stroke, and also uh, body pain and, and even cancer. So these are some of the uh, medical consequences. Of course, we do not say that uh, stress is the only factor that can lead to this, but it can contribute to the occurrence of these medical conditions. Next. And uh, wherever you are, whether you are in the, in the company, I think in a school or, or, or an NGO, so some of these individuals that uh, experience stress, when we have many people uh, in this organization with stress, they can also lead to um, impairment to the function of the organization. So for example, directly because of the um, reduce efficiency of the staff due to the stress symptoms. It can lead to normal health care costs because they have to go to panel clinic to seek treatment, reduce satisfaction with their job, poor job performance, and greater frequency of accidents at workplace. Next one. And indirectly, because of this uh, lower quality of uh, their mental well-being, so it can actually lead to other issues to the to the company or to the organization, like uh, um, breakdown in communication, some workplace um, um, bullying or other discrimination and some other you know, interpersonal issues uh, with this quality in relationship. And uh, it may hinder the opportunity of the, the, of the organization to grow uh, bigger and better. Okay, next one. Okay, so after we have looked at the, what is stress, what are the factors that can lead to stress, what are the symptoms of stress and also the consequences of stress? Now we want to talk about how we manage stress. Okay? So it can be divided into three different stages. 
Okay, first is what we call as primary prevention or intervention, meaning we try to uh, prevent stress, excessive stress from happening to us, right? And secondary management means that we try to moderate or reduce the impact of stress when it happens, when we have to reduce it uh, when we are facing it, try to reduce the, the symptoms that we suffer from it. And tertiary management, meaning we try to um, catch it early when it's a really complication of stress. Like for example, when stress leads to some mental health issue, we try to manage that mental health issue. This is what we call as uh, tertiary management. Okay, move on. So this is what I have already explained to you just now about the different stages of stress. We try to catch it early to reduce the, the level of stressors or we try to reduce the stress response that we are, we are giving rise to this, uh, this uh, stress factors. And lastly, we try to uh, reduce the complication, the outcome that is resulted from the stress. Okay, next. So for primary prevention, uh, we try to um, identify what are the stressors. Like for example, if the problem is the physical environment, it is too cramped, it is too small, uh, or the workload is already too heavy. So we try to think of ways to reduce the effect of these um, external stressors. For example, we try to um, alter the environment, the physical environment where we are, or we may have to renegotiate the workload that we are having, right? At the same time, sometimes it's not just about reducing the stressors, but it's to improve our ability, our competence to deal with the stress. So for example, you have a physically demanding task to do on a regular basis. So it is very tiring, it's very uh, 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 well, overwhelming for you. So we may have to think of a way to improve our skill, our physical stamina in dealing with the tasks that we have to do, right? So this is what we mean by increase the ability to deal with the stressors. And lastly, uh, we have to think about our social support system. Because what happened is we know that in our life, uh, we don't just face with uh, negative things. Right? Sometimes we have these uh, things that are stressful, demands that are stressful for us. Uh, so, but we have people who can um, give us support, who can allow us to uh, share our problem with, and this will actually help to reduce the intensity of these stressors. At the same time, this social system, social support that we have, the, the friends and relatives that we have around us, they can also provide us with some um, positive input, positive experience. So we can see these stressors as a kind of negative ex uh, experience or negative um, uh, input. So this can make us feel upset, make us feel down. But at the same time, if we can maximize, we can increase positive experience that we have with the people around us, it can also help to uh, prevent stress from getting out of control. Okay, next one. And sec in secondary prevention, we want to look at how we respond because remember the secondary stage is related to our stress response. So we want to see how we cope with the stress in a better way. So this is what we call as coping strategies. The intention is to reduce impact of stressful events. So when we talk about coping strategies, it can come in two forms. Okay, we move on. So it's either adaptive or more adaptive strategies. Okay. Later, we are going to talk about some of the examples of um, adaptive uh, strategies to deal with stress. But when we say it's more adaptive, it means that yes, we, give, uh, we actually give in to the behavior, the, the, how to say, some, some negative way or passive way of uh, dealing with the stress in a, um, using behaviors that are not so constructive. So either we try to numb the, our feelings so that we don't feel the stress but by using substances or alcohol, or we allow ourselves to actually express our um, emotional, di uh, emotional disturbance in a very uh, unrestrained way using uh, methods like self-harm, um, um, aggression, and also um, uh, emotional outbursts. So these are some of the examples of uh, giving, uh, giving in to 
uh, uncontrolled express of emotion. This is what we call as more adaptive strategies of coping with stress. Okay, next one. So when we say, uh, when we talk about adaptive coping strategies, uh, they can be divided into problem solving or emotion reducing kind of strategies. Next one. Problem solving strategies, as the name suggests, we try to deal with the problem. We try to solve the problem head on. So we can either uh, seek help from other people, obtain more information so that uh, we can understand the problem better. Uh, so or we can go through some steps of solving problem. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, one example. Yeah, this is the one. It's an acronym called IDEAL. So when we're faced with a particular problem, we can use a guide, something like this. So first, we have to identify what the problem is actually, utilizing our resources like advice from other people um, uh, and also uh, some references and so on and, and our opinion from uh, others. We try to understand the problem in a comprehensive manner. Then we want to identify what are the costs, want to define what can be the problem, what are the the factors can lead to this problem. Then from then you try to uh, determine what would be the possible solutions to this problem. Uh, you already identify what are the factors that lead to this problem. So you want to think about what are the possible solutions. List down these um, alternatives based on their feasibility, their practicability, and their possible, uh, their potential effectiveness in dealing with the problem. And once you have really decided what is your priority, which is the most likely effective uh, method or solution to the problem, act on it, implement it. And after you have done so, uh, try to review the outcome. If the outcome is good, no, you have used a particular solution A to, to deal with the problem and it provides good outcome, so you learn from it and know that next time when you face a similar problem, you can use this solution. But if let's say the outcome is not so ideal, then you can move on to the second possible uh, option and try to uh, solve the problem again, go through the cycle again until you manage to resolve the problem uh, effectively. So this is what we call as a problem solving skill. Okay, next one. And how about emotion reducing strategy? We have to remember that sometimes, yes, I mean, this is our experience. We, we have we faced with a problem. We know we need to deal with it. But at the same time, that problem also gives rise to a lot of emotional disturbances. We, uh, we can get very moody or very irritable or very angry, very upset about what is happening. So sometimes we have to allow our um, emotion to be ventilated first before uh, we can actually solve the problem. Right. So these are some of the strategies we have to learn. To, um, I mean, we have to have a safe channel to ventilate our emotion in a, in a, in a controlled manner. All right. And sometimes to relook at the problem will allow us to have um, less um, emotions um, attached to the issue. Like, for example, when we are, faced, we are facing with a crisis, we may exaggerate the severity of the problem. But if we can have a a uh, second look and uh, reappraise the problem, we may realize that actually the problem is not as severe as it appeared at the first look. So this can help to reduce emotion as well. And sometimes at the beginning when the problem is really overwhelming, for example, you are facing with a very great loss, uh, we may have to, and sometimes automatically you will adopt this method of avoidance of the problem. You may uh, try to uh, postpone from dealing with it, uh, refrain from dealing with it, or deny the existence of the problem for some time. So this, in fact, now usually at the beginning of some very big issues, it is considered an effective and ad adaptive strategy, right? Because we do need some time to to cool down, to prepare ourselves, because we can before we can face a problem as severe as that. But we have to remember that this avoidance of problem cannot be too prolonged. So after we have already uh, use some strategies to reduce our emotion, we have to uh, move on to problem solving strategies. Otherwise, this problem, when it's become prolonged, it can become a chronic, a long term stressor that can lead to prolonged stress rather than reducing stress. So this is what we have to remember. Next one. OK, so these are some of the other 
practical methods that you can use when we are sensing that we already under stress, we already have some of the symptoms uh, from stress, like poor sleep, for example, or, or muscle ache, or poor appetite, and so on. So these are some of the um, evidence-based uh, uh, interventions that can be helpful in situations like this. So first is what we call as relaxation techniques. There are some uh, behavioral techniques that we can use to help ourselves to relax physically and also mentally. And it's proven that um, exercise uh, program, wellness program in uh, improving stamina, uh, reducing body weight, these are some of the uh, interventions that can be helpful also in reducing stress. And last but not least, no, faith, physical, uh, spirituality, religion, religious belief, uh, practice of our, our religion can be also uh, very effective in helping to reduce uh, our level of stress. So in the next two slides, I want to show you a bit uh, some examples of relax relaxation techniques. So the first one is uh, what we call as deep breathing exercise. This is a video actually. I'm not sure whether it can be played or not. Can you try? Can you share the audio? So, uh, in deep breathing exercise, what you're trying to do is actually to regulate our breathing. Because if you realize, you have noticed before this, when we are anxious, when we are under stress, as part of the fight or flight response, we tend to breathe very fast because the body wants to take in more oxygen to prepare for the emergency. But when we are not dealing with the physical stress, we are dealing with some other you know, job stress and other issues, this kind of response actually becomes unnecessary and it causes more uh, unpleasant feelings. So we want to regulate our breathing to reduce our level of stress. So in deep breathing exercise, what we do is we try to breathe in at a slow pace manner, keep our breath for a short while, and then slowly breathe out. Okay. So I think because of time constraint and maybe some technical difficulty, we will not be playing the video. But you can always Google uh, or go to YouTube for look to look for similar uh, videos on relaxation techniques like this. So the term term of it is deep breathing exercise. Uh, if you type in that, you can find similar videos to demonstrate to you. Uh, this is the one I show actually uh, by the staff from uh, HUKM, but you can always look for similar videos like this. The next one is what we call as uh, progressive muscle relaxation, right? So you can also, again, um, uh, look, look for it, search for it online. Uh, but the concept of it is we try to uh, do some muscle contraction and relax the muscle all over the body that's why it's called progressive from one side to another why because as you as we mentioned earlier when you're having uh stress actually you experience body ache why because your mu muscles are already tensed up to get ready for some emergency uh, again so because of that we want to uh, correct this problem and that's why we try to uh, contract and relax our muscle in a stepwise manner so that your body can experience this muscle relaxation, right? So these are two techniques that I'm trying to uh, show you and you can look up for them then, uh, yourself. Okay, I think we just move on to the following slide. Uh, one moment later, doctor, I, I try to uh, video it now. Okay. Yeah, can okay, move on to the next one. Okay, another one that we sometimes forget is humor. So this is how we deal with stress also, right? So this is a conversation between the World War II Prime Minister of uh, United Kingdom, Winston Churchill, and another lady, 
politician as well. So when they're having a heated argument, uh, this lady said this, right? If you're my husband, I will put poison in your coffee. It's uh, like a very nasty comment, right? But uh, he managed to uh, resolve the conflict, right? Using a very humorous response. Right. So sometimes in life, we do have to make use of humor as a way of, to deal with uh, the stressful situation that we are facing. Right. So don't, don't forget about humor as well. Okay, next one. Okay, so now we talk about tertiary prevention. So this will be a brief one, uh, uh, bearing in mind of our time, because this is already moving on to uh, psychiatric disorders. When we talk about tertiary prevention, as I mentioned, it's the outcome. When things get bad, when the stress is persistent, it's getting worse. So eventually, they can lead to mental health problems, mental health disorders, mental disorders. So this is when we have to recognize the symptoms and look for uh, proper treatment, seek proper help. Okay, next one. So this one, I don't think we have time to really go through, but I just want to show you briefly if you can just have a look at the slide. These are some of the common disorders that we have uh, about uh, in, in the mental uh, mental health area. Uh, mood disorders, the common one would be major depressive disorder, and also a lot of time anxiety disorders, okay, whether it's generalized or it's a panic attack and so on. Okay, next one. And yeah, the next slide had some more severe disorder. Just now there was one under mood disorder like bipolar, okay, and schizophrenia. These are the more severe. They are less common, but they are, but they are more severe. But you should, it is not so common in general population. Lah. And some other uh, disorders in the older age group or, or younger age group and also uh, substance problem. Okay, next one. Okay, so in view of time constraint, I would not uh, use this occasion to talk more about the specific disorders. So I think we can uh, skip these slides about the specific disorders. Okay, can move on. Yeah. I hope probably in the future you can have opportunity to learn more about this, but never mind, we move on next. Okay, next one. Okay, next. Okay, next. 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 Okay, so just now there were some disorders. I again, to recap. The important ones that we have to know is that commonly uh, in population, the, the, the mental conditions that we face are either mood disorder in the form of major depression or uh, generalized uh, anxiety disorders. So the one we commonly see, commonly see are like, for example, generalized anxiety disorders or panic disorder. These are the common ones. So yeah, but we have to watch out for that. If someone presents with ongoing, uh, persistent de de uh, low mood or persistent anxiety, then we may have to suspect the presence of these conditions. So how do we screen for that? So here I'm showing you some of the common examples of mental health screening tools. Right? So there are a few here. I just want to highlight the first one. It's called uh, DAS21 or Depression, Anxiety and Stress Scale 2021 item. So this is the one we commonly use. As I said, no stress is common and it commonly leads to depression and anxiety. That's why usually for screening, we will use these two. Can we move on? And this is also the same one that is used by the uh, government, by MOH. Uh, if you go to this eMinda website, then you will see that they actually employ the same tool for screening purpose. So what happened in this screening is that there will be 21 questions with question relevant to depression, anxiety, and stress. When you answer it accordingly, eventually a uh, list of stress, uh, a scores will be given to you, your level of depression, anxiety, and stress. And based on the level, you'll be recommended whether you uh, need to go for further evaluation for any mood or anxiety disorder or not, okay? So if any one of you think that you might be having difficulties in uh, this respect, please go to a website like this to do a screening and see whether you will need further help or not. Okay, next one. So just briefly also about this, uh, because you are in a very Christian society, you know, uh, you are used to giving first aid for uh, physical injuries and, and uh, illness. And but how about mental health? So actually, there is some program overseas for mental health first aid as well. Uh, just that I think, if, as far as I know, it's not really implemented. And we don't have any accredited uh, providers or trainers for this first aid. But they are, I think it's worthwhile for us to share the, the, the concept of this mental health first aid. 
So first of all, uh, we have to assess the risk to self and others. So a lot of time we have to be be alert that someone with severe mental health issues they may do harm to themselves or other people. Not all of them will be having this, but if but some of them, uh, a, cons a, a significant minority of them may have this difficulty, this uh, danger. So we have to identify those with this danger and refer them to help immediately. So this is the first point. You have to rule out the most severe condition, right? So we have to identify them uh, for help. So of course, we can't talk more about this today, but this is the con this is the principle. And then for those with this mental health issue, a lot of time, uh, those who, who are engaging them, we have to be... Uh, non-judgmental, we have to be uh, empathetic, you know, to listen to their struggles, to their difficulty without making uh, criticism or, or harsh comments uh, for the problem they are facing or the symptoms they are experiencing. So what we can do as uh, the health, uh, as a, as a um, uh, provider uh, of um, first aid to them, we can uh, reassure them and tell them information about seeking help encourage them to seek appropriate help from mental health professional and also to encourage them who are still not maybe their, their condition is not so high risk and they may need some time before they can see a professional encourage them to practice some of these self-help self-help strategies that i've already told you earlier also okay so this is what we call as mental health first aid okay next one okay and besides that we know that there are some uh, helplines available, hotlines for those who need help, but when help is not immediately available, they can call these numbers and get help, for example, from the defenders. Okay, next one. And then uh, we have this uh, lifeline organization also. They are also providing uh, counseling services. Okay, next one. And we have a few more uh, mental health associations. This is the Malaysian Mental Health Association. And there is one more. Next one. Uh, which is the mental health, uh, uh, another mental health organization, Miasa, that is also providing resources for uh, counseling and also uh, other venues of help. Okay, thanks, one. So, briefly, okay, when we talk about seeking help, so you will also need to understand who are the people, who are the mental health professionals who can help uh, with mental health issues. So, first, we have counselors, they are trained in counseling, so they are. Uh, more competent in providing general uh, counseling, meaning they may help the counselee to um, solve their problem in a more effective manner, communicate in more effective manner, and deal with interpersonal issues uh, in a better way. So they are more of helping to deal with uh, common mental health issues, but not about treating mental health dis mental disorders. Okay, so counsellors they usually don't deal with people with who are already diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder, but more of those with some general mental health issues, right? So on the other hand, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists, they do treat people with psychiatric illness. So clinical psychologists, they are trained in psychology. So when they treat patients with uh, mental illness, they do it by uh, doing psychotherapy. So they are more of psychological intervention. Psychiatrists, they are doctors. So we are medical doctors who are trained in mental illness. So we will provide uh, treatment mainly using medication and also combined with some psychological interventions because we are also trained with, in uh, psychological uh, therapy as well. So these are the, some of the differences. When, if you are not sure before this, no, at least we have an idea uh, what are the job scopes of these different categories of mental health professionals. The next one. So what are the pathways of seeking help? So to seek help from a psychiatrist, uh, usually this is how you get help in uh, public health uh, public uh, uh, health services. Uh, it can be either outpatient or inpatient. So outpatient, you will need a referral letter from outside doctors to come and see us in either KKM or, M, uh, or MOE hospital, or you, uh, the patient can actually get help as an inpatient if the condition is more severe. And this can happen voluntarily, like any other patient who goes to hospital to seek help, or sometimes when the patient is quite unstable and not willing to come to hospital, the patient can actually be admitted involuntarily if it is determined by the doctor that the patient does have high risk of harm to self or other people. So of course, we will not simply admit patient against their will, but when it's really necessary, this can be done. 
Okay, so I guess with that, uh, I'm coming to the last slide. Uh, I mean, this the next one will be the last slide of our topic today. So briefly, what will happen if someone comes to us for treatment? So as I mentioned, medication, psychotherapy, sometimes we may use other form of biological treatment as well. And also they can be uh, involved in some rehabilitation activities, like for those who need it, some job training and some daycare activities and so on. And the important point here, of course, we always try to establish a good relationship with the patient so that they can uh, trust us and, and cooperate with us to recover. All right, so I think with that, uh, this is the end. Um, if there is any question. Yeah, any question from the participant? Please feel free to ask. Uh, my apologies, uh, first of all, for the difficulty, technical difficulties at the beginning. So I think we have wasted some time for that. So it's a bit rushed. <laughs> uh, but if you have any question, if uh, the moderator allows, I'm happy to take questions from you. Uh, okay, doctor, I, I have one question regarding uh, help, uh, seeing of help. For example, mm. uh, someone they may facing a problem of this uh, stress, right? Yes. So uh, at the first place, the, they can they have to go through the counselor, clinical psychology, or only uh, to the psychiatric, or they can refer direct to the psychiatric if for okay. the public. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. So, um, if the symptoms that is experienced by a person is not too severe, like for example, individual A or B, you know, is suspect that I may have some issue, I suggest maybe you can try to do some self screening first using the tool that I have suggested just now. So, if it turned out to be the score is quite high. Then you can always go to, uh, if the symptom is not too severe yet, you can try to go to uh, what you call this a counselor's counseling service. That's, that is an option if you are hesitant to come and see doctor at the beginning. But if the but what happened in our hospital setting is when the patient comes to us, their conditions are really quite severe. So for example, someone who has depression is already quite suicidal for instance, or someone with a more severe disorder, like a psychotic disorder, schizophrenia, they have really had prominent behavioral problem, right? So in such case, they do need to come and see a doctor straight away. So what, what can be done if that is the case? So as I mentioned earlier, either the patient is still willing to come and seek treatment for us, they can uh, actually go to a, a GP first, either in a private clinic or government clinic because we are a specialist center you see in government hospitals so you need to get a referral to come to us but if you are going to see a private psychiatrist then yes you can directly uh, book an appointment with the private doctor to see the to, to, to see the psychiatrist directly so after the patient has come to us then we will do an assessment whether it's necessary for the patient to uh, to actually get admitted for inpatient treatment if not treatment can be started as outpatient so how about uh, seeking treatment from psychologists? So it can happen in both ways also. That means um, the patient can come to us first and we feel that the patient needs some more intensive psychotherapy. We can refer the patient to the psychotherapist or uh, a patient can choose to seek treatment from a psychotherapy, psychotherapist or psychologist first. Like for someone with depression or anxiety disorder, you feel like, okay, maybe I should see a psychologist for some psychotherapy. And if the condition doesn't get better, then the patient can be referred to a doctor to start medication. So it's either way. Of course, uh, from our perspective, there is a little advantage of seeking treatment from a psychiatrist first. Because what we can do is, as medical doctor, we can screen the patient for possible physical condition, medical condition that can contribute to the mental health issues. Because uh, the public has to remember that uh, sometimes, mental health symptoms like uh, depression or anxiety, they can actually be symptoms of a physical problem. For example, a uh, thyroid problem or some other um, uh, hormonal issues, for example. So it is important actually for us to screen for medical conditions before we decide this is a pure mental health issue and we treat it with uh, proper treatment. So that would be the, what I say, um, uh, a bit of an advantage if you come and see a doctor, a psychiatrist first, because we can rule out this physical condition. But if it's quite clear that the condition is a pure 
psychiatric issue or mental health issue, it is okay, it's all right for you to seek treatment from either a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist. Okay, uh, thanks for the uh, clear explanation, doctor. So basically, uh, as uh, I have the some of the question uh, before this webinar, some of the te school teacher do share with me uh, because due to MCO, then a lot of students they learn uh, study through online and so on. By the time they back to the school, they they found that they they couldn't catch up with the slippers. Then they very quiet and they confine themselves in the room, even though they are crying in the school. No, so uh, this are the, this is possible is the one of the problem, and some of that the school there's a council but eventually it's not hooked. So do you think that at this type of case we should recommend that direct refer to a psychiatry? Oh, okay, in the case like this I don't think we can make a general statement because there are so many students with different level of symptoms they are showing, right? So we, I cannot uh, give uh, like a general recommendation about this, but I think in the case like this it's really important for the teacher and the parents to get involved in the first place. Because uh, I think we all understand that we cannot rely on uh, one or two counselor teacher uh, and counselor in the school to actually deal with so many stu students in, in the school with problems. So first of all, I think in a case like this, it's really necessary for the teacher to engage the parents to understand the condition of this student at home as well. If there is any clear, is any really clear concerns about the um, mental health of this particular student, then yes, I would say that uh, it's better for the student to get as, uh, properly assessed. So when I say properly assessed, we can do, go to the primary care level of uh, assessment. So it can be either counsellor or a GP because our medical colleague, a general practitioner, they are supposed to have some knowledge on mental health as well. If uh, either the counsellor or the uh, doctor, general practice doctor, they, they suspect that the, the, the kid or the student is really having some diagnosable mental mental disorder, then they will make the necessary referral for further assessment. But from our clinical practice, what I would say that usually this uh, either is adult or younger students, usually we get them referred referred from GP when the parents or teacher notice that they have some they are they are they have something wrong and then uh, this is uh, conveyed uh, to to the parents, for example, when the teacher notice something wrong with the student, tell the uh, to the parents about it, then they will bring the 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 kid for further assessment uh, through to a GP usually. Okay, uh, thanks for the explanation. Uh, can I check with the audience participant? Do you have any other question to ask, doctor? Yeah. Uh, if there is no question to the doctor, so uh, I would like to take this opportunity lah, to thanks for the doctor to sharing very informative information to us because as uh, we understand that no, uh, there is no help without mental help. Our mental is very important. So uh, I, I hope that uh, all the participants will be enjoying on this session. And once again, we would like to thanks doctor for sharing with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.